Hello and good evening. My name is Caroline Baum and I am delighted to welcome you to this special author event on behalf of the Geelong Regional Library Corporation. There are still a few of you making your way into this webinar, so I'm going to leave you a couple more moments to settle in. It's great actually to see so many people registered for this event, which demonstrates that even though some people say that they're a bit zoomed out, this story is a compelling drawcard. The Geelong Regional Library Corporation acknowledges Warrawurrung and Eastern Ma, original owners of the lands on which the library services operate. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge and celebrate First Nations people as the custodians of learning, knowledge and story. Now you can, I'm sure you're keen to know this, you can ask questions at the end of my conversation with Jenny by going to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you can post your questions there and obviously we will try and get to as many of them as we can. So there she is. Our special guest this evening is Jenny Hocking, Emeritus Professor at Monash University and Distinguished Whitlam Fellow at the Whitlam Institute at the University of Western Sydney. She is also the award-winning biographer of Gough Whitlam, Lionel Murphy and Frank Hardy, a formidable trio if ever there was one. The story of the Palace Papers is the stuff of headlines and at times I felt that it read like fiction or like a series of sketches by Monty Python using tortuous language to create Byzantine levels of obfuscation and obstruction that would be hilarious if they weren't of such grave national significance. At times, I have to say, this book made my blood boil with indignation at the hoops that Jenny had to jump through to get to history that actually belongs to us. Jenny spent 10 years campaigning for access to the correspondence between Sir John Kerr, Governor General during the Whitlam era, and the Queen. The Palace Letters is a gripping story of collusion, secrecy, and deception. Now, we know the outcome of this story and Jenny's historic, glorious victory in the High Court, but it's still a great thrill to be able to talk to her today about some of the twists and turns that her quest for the truth took. Welcome, Jenny. Thanks very much, Carolyn, and thanks to the Geelong Library for inviting me tonight. It's a great thrill to be here. Um, I want to start with a couple of personal questions because I just want um, us to get to know you a little bit better um, as the crusader in this book. And I was interested in the fact that you dedicate this book to your mother. And I was wondering, for those who don't know, whether you could tell us a little bit about who your mother was. Yes, thanks, Carolyn. I, I dedicated this to my mother, Barbara Hocking. She was herself a, uh, a remarkable formidable and very persistent woman. She was a barrister um, and she was actually the first barrister briefed in the Mabo case. Her, uh, her thesis, which she'd done at Monash University, a, a master's thesis in law, um, was really putting the groundwork to the legal case, um, arguing that native title should be recognized in Australian common law. And my mother then gave a really important paper at the famous Townsville conference where um, Eddie Marbo sp spoke and Henry Reynolds, of course, spoke. And her paper was called Why There Should Be a High Court Challenge um, to, to uh, Over Native Title. And really, she's been described as the intellectual architect of the Marbo case by a Canadian law professor. And yet, I think, like Unfortunately, many women, many women scholars and many women artists and many women in general, their stories are often forgotten. But uh, I have not forgotten her story and my sister Barbara and I have spent uh, some time writing about her whenever we can. And uh, I was delighted to dedicate this book to her. She played a great role in my life. Well, she would have been very proud of you and you've clearly inherited some of her fighting spirit. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, though, if, you know, in the way you tell the story, there are obviously moments of great disappointment and moments of great um, agonizing uh, over decisions that are pending. But I'm wondering whether you can remember now, what was the lowest point for you in all of this? 
Oh, look, I think undoubtedly the lowest point was when our appeal to the federal court, the full federal court, did not succeed. Uh, it was close. It was one, um, uh, a two-one decision. Um, but I had really high hopes of that because I, I felt that the case had gone so well through its hearing that our, um, our evidentiary base was so strong. It's an unusual case because it brings together law and history. And so what you see unfold in the book and what unfolded through the court case was bringing together a mass of archival material that formed the empirical base of the court case. Now, we knew how strong that was. We'd had a marvellous um, barrister first with Anthony Whitlam in the federal court, and then, of course, with Brett Walker at the full federal court on appeal. And so I was disappointed that day. Um, and I was also disappointed because I just couldn't see, in terms of the financial requirements of continuing, how that could possibly be. So. Look, I want to thank the people who all contributed through our Chuffed fundraising campaign, which was so important to the case, and just the many people who wrote to me and encouraged me to continue. And I knew if I possibly could, I would. And uh, that's set out in the book how I took each step at a time, really, because if you think about it as ending up as a high court action, it's so daunting. I'm not sure if I would have continued the way it went from the outset, but if I took it simply one step at a time in the famous footballer's mantra, mantra, take one step at a time and control the things you can control. Um, I decided, you know, if we could minimise the financial risk, uh, if the legal advice was that the case continued to be strong, then I would take it as far as I could. And I'm so very pleased that we were able to do that. I'm very glad that you mentioned the crowdfunding because it's such a clever way of getting around this terrifying prospect of, you know, having to pay enormous costs that you were at one stage, you know, you were liable for a lot of money. Um, whose idea was it to crowdfund it? And were you surprised by the speed and the degree of enthusiasm? Because it seemed to sort of um, cascade very quickly. Look, you're right. And I was surprised by that. But I should point out that all of the legal team worked on a pro bono basis. And it's really opened my eyes and I want to thank them so very much because this could never have happened without that extraordinary support. Um, Tom Brennan uh, is the other major barrister, Tom Brennan SC, who was with us from the very beginning and they were instructed by Cause Chambers Westgarth. But it was really out of a conversation with Tom Brennan who had written a marvellous piece called Australians Own Their History <laughs> about the palace letters and the fact that we couldn't get access to them. And as you said, that made my blood boil because <laughs> as a historian and knowing this history has been so badly served, uh, you know, we understand the Whitlam dismissal so much more than we did previously. It was vitally important that we access them. But despite the fact that they work pro bono, there are enormous expenses attached to um, taking any sort of legal action at that level. And I must say, it's a staggering process. And I'm, you know, on one level, I'm absolutely delighted that I had the opportunity to experience that given the outcome, but also just as a process, it's so fascinating. So very early on, I knew that I'd have to crowdfund and try to get additional funds. Um, and I was lucky enough to have someone working with me as a research assistant, Nell Reedy. Thank you, Nell, who was au fait with all of these uh, uh, these aspects that I knew nothing about. I'd never heard of crowdfunding. I didn't, you know, <laughs> I wasn't um, thinking of this in advance, but it became a core part of, of, of the court case and the essential financial support that otherwise it, it, I wouldn't have been able to continue. And I, I was surprised, just to answer your final point, look, we also had a wonderful media management, Terry King, who had worked at, um, at, at Melbourne University Press when I published the Whitlam books there. She just struck out on her own with some other people. And she joined um, as, as, a, as, as, as a sort of media liaison person. And Terry managed to get the case mentioned on so many um, media, including 730 report. And we found that the night that the case was launched, we had a report on 7.30 and honestly the crowdfunding just went crazy over the weekend and I was so delighted and that's what enabled us to continue. So each of those elements had to come together and had to work perfectly. Yes, and it's very much a team effort as you've acknowledged. I wondered though, you don't mention this in the book, uh, Jenny, but was there a flip side to that? So for all the enthusiasm and support, did you get any hate mail? Look, 
I didn't. And actually, Carolyn, that's a very interesting point. I mean, every now and then there might be a rude tweet or or something like that. But but no, I I I I didn't find that sort of level of invective. And I must admit that surprised me too. Um, I mean, the Whitlam period is very much one that has polarised people. But I think the difference with this case is that this was a case, regardless of what you thought about the Whitlam period and the Whitlam dismissal, it was a case about bringing critical documents out of the archives where our own archives was protecting them, paying for their upkeep and maintaining them, and the Queen had embargoed our access to them. So it was much more something that reflected an ongoing relationship with the crown that was just not right in a in a in a in a, in a, mod, in a modern democracy and a sense that we ought to be able to know our history in this critical aspect absolutely now you are a very seasoned truffler through archives and you clearly love being in archives some people find um, you know, trawling through documents, a very deadening, very leaden kind of part of research if they're working on a biography or if they're working on a thesis, but you clearly thrive there. I think one of the things that's so extraordinary about your book is the way this case, instead of us thinking of archives as places of access, suddenly this case presents us with an archive as a place of withholding. And this is partly, I think, because of the ambiguity around the terms under which Kerr deposited documents there. So can you just walk us through the concept of the instruments of deposit? Well, you're right, I do love archives. I, I, I think particularly when you have a contested history and what a contested history, the history of the dismissal has been, but also the period of the Whitlam government, archival material that takes you back to the time, it sets a record and it's a really important record to know. So I knew already from Kerr's papers, which I had opened a, a great deal of when I was working on Whitlam's biography, no one else had spent time trawling through them, astonishingly enough, but they told quite a different story. So I did know how important the letters were. I'd found extracts from some of the palace letters between Kerr and the Queen in Kerr's archive. So I was building a picture of them, um, but the critical description that the archives used was a simple one, a single word, personal. And this word personal has to be one of the most powerful words in, in archival access quests. Because of that, those letters they told me do not come under the Archives Act. The Archives Act only relates to things called Commonwealth records, but people can also lodge their personal papers there and they're held under their own conditions. And those conditions are set by what's called an instrument, instrument of deposit. So the instrument of deposit is simply the terms of access. I was always told that these terms of access had been set by Kerr and that Kerr said no one can look at them until after 60 years and other requirements as well. However, once I started asking about them, it became clear that actually these terms of access were set by the Queen and they were set after Kerr died. So immediately I thought, how can they be personal if Kerr himself didn't set the terms of access to them? And I never thought about a court case. It was only once these things started to come together and gel some years later that the court case and the arguments for the court case actually emerged. Now, this is made more complicated because there are in fact two sets of letters. Yes, <laughs> that's right. And initially our court case asked for both. And the interesting thing about the second set of letters is that this is a complete copy it's a complete copy of the original letters, the letters between Kerr and the Queen, and they were taken by David Smith, the Governor General's official secretary, late one night um, after Kerr had left office um, due to this sort of arduous photocopy of hundreds of pages of letters so he could take a complete set for Kerr, who was by that time living in the south of France, where he was writing his memoirs. Now, I knew all that, because I'd come across these extraordinary letters between Kerr and David Smith as, as Smith is photocopying the letters. So there was another set which was a per, genuinely personal set. That is a personal set taken by Kerr, placed in his papers decades later by his stepdaughter um, and under different conditions. I argued that I ought to be able to see both and it was only during the court case that I found out that five years earlier, the, the National Archives had actually 
at best misled and at worst lied to me when they told me that the copies were not available for access because they were held under the same conditions as the originals. That was not true. We asked for those documents during the court proceedings and it showed quite clearly that I should have had access to the copies of the letters five years earlier. So the archives did not come out of this process well, I have to say. No, and I want that brings me neatly to the first of the sort of dramatis personae that I wanted to um, linger on. David Fricker, um, there's a line in the book where you say that you think that the way he behaved in his role at the archives um, was perhaps more appropriate to his previous role where he had been number two at ASIO. So clearly from his point of view, secrecy and withholding information was more important than sharing it. What is your uh, relationship with David Fricker like now? Oh, look, I, I, I have to say, it's not what I would have wanted it to be in the sense that I had hoped to interview David Fricker for this book. I mean, we'd always had a perfectly um, polite, professional, uh, good relationship, understanding our different positions on the letters prior to their release. It's safe to say, because he told me this, that the decision of the High Court utterly shocked him. He was not anticipating it. He was not uh, prepared for it in that sense. And I have to say that some shutters went up at that point. I tried to see him immediately afterwards. And I did eventually, after a few days, manage to get through and did have a, a meeting with him. And I proposed that we come together in a public event, that we show that this was a shared journey and that these letters were now going to be released. It was, I have to say, immensely disappointing that he did not take me up on that. In fact, he did not speak to me at all about the public release of the letters. I found out that they were going to be released in full from a journalist who rang me for a comment. I was not involved in their release. I was not Zoomed in. Um, there was no request that I be involved and I received an invitation after I'd already been told by journalists and that, that they were to be released. So I found that inappropriate, disappointing and disrespectful to be perfectly frank. Um, I, I was told that if I wanted to interview David Fricker afterwards, I was to put questions in writing I, I felt, again, that was not appropriate, but there are a couple of questions I did put to him in writing that he then did not answer. So, <laughs> you know, I think all of that is not appropriate for the person at the head of our largest and most significant repository of public records, who describes himself as being at the head of uh, a pro-disclosure organisation, which is a term I, 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 that fills me with wonder. Um, and, <laughs> And so, yes, I was deeply concerned about, um, ab about the decisions that the archives took, which, because all of costs went against them at the High Court, they've spent $2 million of taxpayers' money out of their limited budget fighting a really significant access request to really significant archival documents. Absolutely. I just want to quote something that I think is very powerful that you say in the book, the National Archives of Australia, whose key function is to collect, preserve and provide access to our most important historical records, had refused to confirm or deny its own access conditions and practices relating to the palace letters, some of the most significant records in the nation's recent political history, whatever had become of this trusted repository of our national memory, you ask rhetorically, pointedly. Um, what do you think, Jenny, has been the reputational damage to the institution of the archives as a result of this case? Look, I think it's added to pre-existing concerns. Uh, it's been a long time now that scholars, um, researchers, people like myself who spend a great deal of time in the archives and for whom archival research is absolutely foundational, have expressed concern about the time frame, delays, extensive delays and extensive redactions um, being done um, to material that, that we've requested. I now have been waiting nine years for over 20 documents, nine years. The, the statutory requirement is that these are dealt with within 90 days. The requests for access are dealt with within 90 days. 
There's a category that they use called withheld pending advice. And there's been an excellent article written and many articles written discussing the, the growth of that term withheld pending that seems to give a, a let out clause where archives say, well, we need to get advice from other organisations that might be ASO, it might be the Attorney General's Department, it's whoever the, the precipitating institution is. And then they just wait and say, well, there's nothing we can do. It's with the other organisations. So there's a long-standing concern that archives is not meeting some of its core requirements that research and researchers have suffered as a result. And I put this in that category, the, 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 the view that material is there to protect the depositor and not necessarily there to prioritise public access. And I should point out that by the time the case came to the High Court, the Federal Attorney General Christian Porter had joined the archives in their case against me, uh, in, their, in their respondent's case against me. So I was facing not only um, the archives, but also the federal government and of course Buckingham Palace put in submissions arguing against their, uh, the letters being open. So it, 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 I, I think the archives has aligned itself with that attitude and that approach but one other thing I will say to the archives credit is that when the decision was made that the letters would be released, I argued very strongly that this had implications for the other letters of other governors general to and from the Queen. I can tell you that just before Christmas, the archives informed me that they will in fact be releasing 30 years of records between other governors general and the Queen going back to Casey in 1966. So this is a fantastic outcome. They will be redacted. We're waiting for those redactions, but they will be released. And so uh, that's that's been a huge overturning of what was previously just established practice. Any documentation from the Queen, you cannot see. Well, now we can, and it's a world first. That's fantastic news. But at the same time, Jenny, does this case make you think, my God, what else is in there that we should know about and that we can't get to if only we knew to look for it? Oh, absolutely. And uh, there's no doubt about that. You know, in many respects, uh, archival research is very much at the mercy of not just decisions on access, but even more, I suppose, pedestrian decisions about what goes into the catalogue, because there's a lot of material that archival staff know how to look for it behind the sort of frontispiece that we might see that I have no idea, for example, how to get to. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes it's a matter of finding someone who will walk you through that, who will take you to material, material that isn't on the catalogue doesn't mean it's not in the archives, but of course you don't know it's not in the archives because you don't even know it's there in the first place. So, look, it is, it, it, it just highlights how important transparency, um, ease of access, and I think prioritising public access. That, I think that presumption of public access is something we really need to return to. And I, that's what I don't see at the moment in the archivals, in the archive decisions. Mm. As if all of that were not bad enough, another great shock and revelation to me in your book was that personal records such as the palace letters could be withdrawn from access, destroyed or sold to the highest bidder. Well, this is something that, that came out through the court case and our lawyers argued this very strongly, that this was the corollary of maintaining this fiction of the letters as personal. Because being personal, of course, the depositor, which we understood was Kerr, but actually was the Queen, can put their own terms and conditions. That's the essence of lodging a personal paper. And the depositor can also change those terms and conditions. And indeed, that's, what's hap that's what happened to the copies of the letters midway through the case, destroying 50% of our argument and half our case midway through the court case, because the archives and Sir John Kerr's uh, stepdaughter changed the original terms and conditions and made it impossible for us to access them. Now, what that showed us was that she could equally have changed it to say, I'm withdrawing it from the archives or I'm deciding to sell them as my personal records. So it does leave a great vulnerability over what might be very important uh, documents in our history, historical documents that could in fact be removed by the person who's put them there under their own terms and conditions of access. So I do think there's a lot of work to be done in the archives out of this case in terms of how they deal with um, historical records that are in fact personal papers. It's a, it's a really important um, gap in our archival system, I think, that needs to be fixed. 
Absolutely. And at times it seemed to me that the case arguing that the, the papers were personal was so disingenuous and just a piece of legal sophistry. Well, obviously the High Court agreed. And, <laughs> and, and, and the way in which our Archives Act is, is, uh, is, is built, the, the key terminology is one of property. Um, mm. And so really, you know, on many levels, it's a, it's a, it's a dense legal argument about whether these letters are property of the Commonwealth. But, but what gave it such great, um, to me, fascinating and entertaining at times elements was the fact that we were talking about the central relationship between a governor general and the queen, the monarch, the two positions at the apex of a constitutional monarchy and whether the British system of archives that is locking up royal archives at the say-so of the queen ought to also apply here. And so, of course, our barrister Brett Walker had a field day with this in arguing that, you know, we the the, the, the plethora of castles <laughs> held by by a hereditary monarch have no place in a democratic society and a democratic polity that has a unitary archival system as we do here. And it, it, there were elements of the High Court and the uh, Federal Court that I found absolutely riveting, <laughs> and I, it was important to convey that through the book in a way that didn't get lost in a quagmire of legal argument. So that was a challenge. <laughs> I cannot believe the clarity with which you explain all, all of this to us. It's so complex forensically. I want to come to the next sort of um, character in the cast, if you like, of Dramatis Personae. Um, obviously, the person who represents the crown is not the queen herself writing these letters. It's her uh, most senior uh, private secretary, um, Sir Martin Charteris, whom we know, some, some of us know, as a, a minor figure in the current series of The Crown. And um, I just wonder whether you could characterize him a little bit for us, because he seems so slippery to me. I think slippery is a very good word. He, he is a long time uh, functionary of Buckingham Palace. He was a deputy um, uh, a private secretary to the Queen for many, many years under Sir, Sir Michael Adeen, who was the previous private secretary. So he's very experienced. Um, he, he knows the uh, intricacies of this relationship. And you can really see through the letters that he's playing Sir John Kerr. He's dropping materials to Kerr that he knows Kerr will adopt, that he knows Kerr will follow up without ever being as direct as, um, as, as, as the letters themselves suggest he could be. Um, and I find Charteris, um, I suppose the word might be oleaginous. Um, <laughs> and, and it's a direct contrast, that sort of supercilious arrogance with which he treats Kerr. Malcolm Turnbull says in his wonderful foreword to the book that it's, it's as if um, head office is speaking to a branch office in the, in the colonies and it really has that aspect to it. The most shocking thing to me, I think, is the way in which Sir John Kerr, as our Governor General, our representative here in this country, is so, um, so subservient, so... Um, so desperately seeking the approbation of the palace, so desperately wanting their approval. It's, it's really, as again, Turnbull describes it as, as groveling and as stomach churning. And I think as an Australian reading them, you do feel, or I certainly felt this profound embarrassment and dismay that he could position Australia in such a subservient way through the letters. And of course, Charteris sees this wonderful opening there and is parrying with Kerr all the way through. And it, it makes the letters quite fascinating. I'm sure it makes the crown fascinating, although I have to say I haven't watched it. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, Charteris is, is a real character. And apparently he was the Queen's favourite uh, private secretary. Yes, I read that too. I mean, I have to say, Jenny, obviously we should point out that Martin Charteris is dead. He died in 1999. Yeah. And I presume the fact that everybody involved, all the major people involved in this story are dead, is of a great, is of great help. Well, 
Yes, and they're not all passed away, but certainly all of the ones involved in the immediate action of 1975 have have died. Um, uh, 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 Sir uh, so, so, um, Anthony Mason, of course, who is still with us uh, and still very um, very uh, uh, capable and 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 does still uh, speak publicly. Um, I interviewed for the biography of Whitlam because, of course, I uncovered that extraordinary story about his involvement um, uh, with Kerr in the lead up to the dismissal and that he wrote a draft letter of dismissal for Kerr and that he was very much an active player in that. Mm. Um, the only other person of immediate role was, of course, David Smith, um, Kerr's official secretary, so the Australian counterpart, if you like, to charters at that time. I interviewed many, many people over the last decades as I worked um, both on Whitlam's biography and then on a book called The Dismissal Dossier, everything you were never meant to know about November 1975, and then, of course, about on this court case and the book, The Palace Letters. And I have to say that David Smith is the only person who refused to speak to me repeatedly. I asked to speak to him many times um, across the years, and each time he has refused which again, I think is so disappointing. He has a wonderful story to tell, he's told it to others. Uh, and I think that decision by public figures to pick and choose who they might share their story with um, is, a, is a very disappointing one, yes. Well, it certainly is if you're a biographer, it's the ultimate sort of frustrated sort of, you know, locked door. But just dwelling on Charteris for a moment, I do see this oleaginous kind of, um, flattering going on and the desperate sycophancy and neediness of Kerr. But for me, the most chilling uh, exchange is when Charteris replies to Kerr that um, if things were to reach this kind of crescendo of, um, um, say, Whitlam dismissing, attempting to dismiss Kerr, quote, the crown would find a way to delay things. Yes, uh, this is a stunning um, discovery I actually made, when I, again, from Kerr's papers when I was working on Whitland's biography. There's a journal that Kerr kept, which part of which went up to the court as part of our evidentiary base, in which he described some of the letters that he was getting back from the palace at the time. It's the first indication that Kerr was talking about the possible dismissal of the government months before he did so. And what is really staggering about that and gives the total lie to this view that the Queen knew nothing about that prospect um, is that Kerr has raised, as he says in his journal, he's raised with Prince Charles in Papua New Guinea at the Independence Day celebration. And as I say in the book, it's like all of the key protagonists are there. It's a Shakespearean sort of meeting of them all. Whitlam's there, Charles, the Prince Charles is there, Kerr is there. Um, Fraser's there and Garfield Barwick is there. God. And Kerr has uh, this really significant conversation with Charles where he expresses his concern that Whitlam, you know, supply hasn't even been blocked yet. It's not blocked for another month. And yet he's talking to, to Prince Charles about the possibility that if it is blocked, Whitlam, I might need to remove Whitlam because he might try and remove me. It's just extraordinary. Now, he relates that he then got a letter relating to that uh, discussion with Charles from Sir Martin Charteris. So the critical question for me, and the first letter I looked for when the letters were open was, is there a letter from Sir Martin Charteris soon after this meeting with Charles validating what Kerr has said in his journal? And yes, there is. And that letter comes in early October, which is when Kerr recalled it coming. And it says that Prince Charles has come back from Port Moresby. He's spoken to the Queen at some length about your conversation, about the difficulties you're facing and about your concerns. And he replies that um, if Whitlam tries to remove you from office, there would be that firstly, that the Queen would take most unkindly to it. And that's a very, very important comment, which I'll come back to later if you want me to. But, but, but then says there would be considerable comings and goings. That's the expression used. Uh, but at the end of the road, so there's a sense of, you know, Kerr interpreted it as delay, obviously, in his journal, the Queen would have to take the advice of the Prime Minister. Now, many people interpreted that as the Queen's, as Charter was saying, the Queen would ha have to take the advice of Mr Whitlam. 
It doesn't say that. This is a conversation in the context of the removal of a government and the replacement of that government with another. At the end of the road, the Queen will have to take the advice of the Prime Minister. It's, again, one of those <laughs> slippery, ambiguous, heavily contextualised conversations, but you have to know all of the bits around it, the other archival material surrounding it, in order to understand what Charteris is saying. So fascinating. And, you know, of course, my eyes lit up when I saw this letter and I thought, well, it validates what Kerr has written elsewhere in that journal, which was a very important validation. So let's go back then to uh, maybe it's a euphemism uh, that the Queen would take uh, that most unkindly. Is that like Queen Victoria saying we are not amused? Look, the critical thing here is, and the reason that's a very important comment and it has been picked up by many people who understand the constitutional relationship, is the key constitutional aspect of a constitutional monarchy is that the palace and the Queen remain politically neutral at all times. Now, that is so much the core of a constitutional monarch within a Westminster liberal system that it's on, the, it's on the, the royal website. If you look at the royal website, it actually says, as a constitutional monarch, the Queen remains politically neutral at all times, cannot involve herself in domestic political matters. Now, here is the Queen expressing a view, a, a direct view to the Governor General, secret from the Prime Minister, about a matter of his own possible recall. And the reason that is so critical is not only because, of course, it's flagging to Kerr in the context of the possible dismissal of the Prime Minister, that she would be most unhappy if Kerr is recalled, but there is no comment whatsoever about the prospective dismissal of the, of the Prime Minister by Kerr, which is the context of that conversation. The other point to make is that since the Imperial Conference of 1930, and this is a political science point, but it's an important one, there is only one person to whom the monarch speaks about the appointment of a Governor General, and that is the Prime Minister. So they are discussing the possible appointment or recall of a Governor General secret from the Prime Minister and directly against that constitutional requirement. So to me, that's, that's a, a really significant letter. There are several significant letters I document in the book leading up to Whitman's dismissal, but absolutely no doubt that Kerr took great heart from those sorts of comments which can only be seen as supportive comments for him and his tenure as he's considering dismissing the Whitlam, uh, 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 the Whitlam government. Absolutely. Jenny, what difference would it have made if we had known all of this sooner? Great question. I've been thinking about that a lot. I think in the 45 years since, we can only imagine the absolute uproar that would have occurred had any of this been known during 1975. I mean, it was a decade before we even knew that Malcolm Fraser was secretly talking to Kerr on the morning of November the 11th. Both of them had lied publicly about that conversation. And it was only a few years ago that I found um, in a posthumously released uh, interview by Reg Withers, his Senate leader, that Fraser had in fact been in telephone conversation with Kerr in the weeks leading up to the dismissal. So the more this material was known at the time, I think the more we would have understood that there was a gathering uh, set of collusions against the Whitlam government. And of course, most fundamentally, it would have given Whitlam the opportunity to call a half Senate election to, uh, 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 to advise the Governor General um, and to advise the Parliament of his decision as Prime Minister. As it was, he and his government were completely flying blind. So I think it would have been enormously damaging for both the monarchy and certainly for Kerr. Uh, he, he, there was no way he could have retained his position had this been known, and no one would have expected him to. No, no. So do you think that this case um, furthers the cause of us becoming a republic in a meaningful way, or do you think that those who say, you know, nothing's going to happen on that front until the Queen dies, are they, are they right? We just have to wait? Look, I think in, in the sense of politically and strategically, it probably is sensible to wait until the Queen dies. Um, there's a very strong view that it would appear disrespectful for us to move uh, towards a republic 
under her uh, reign, even though many other uh, Commonwealth countries have and have done so with um, the palace's blessing. Um, but I think certainly this case and what the letters have revealed to us about the events of 1975, I mean, the palace in secret discussions with the governor general about the possible dismissal of a government, I mean, it's, it's appalling. Um, and, and the one thing that is not mentioned in the letters in any great detail that ought to be central to this question, uh, I mean, in my view, they ought not to have been discussing it at all, but certainly given that they are, the critical question is what is the Prime Minister's advice? And the stark absence in these letters is the failure of either Kerr to give or Charteris to ask, what is your Prime Minister's advice? And of course, Whitlam was advising the half Senate election. So I do think it, it has advanced the cause of the Republic. I should say I'm on the national executive of the Australian Republic movement. And I feel very strongly that it shows, uh, I mean, as indeed as an independent nation, we ought to have um, a, 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 be a, an independent nation that makes our own decisions on these things. There are still areas where the Queen can have a final veto. There are still areas where um, there are lingering what Whitlam called colonial relics, the relics of colonialism that tie us to the crown and the monarchy in ways we never anticipated. And these letters are one of those ways. It's dynamite, I have to say, it's dynamite on every page. Now, I, one of the villains of the piece who is kind of a sort of minor villain, if you like, but he's a bete noir of mine, so I just wanted to mention him, is George Brandis. I was not at all surprised to discover that he'd had a long friendship with um, Kerr from his student days. Um, Clearly, there was a conflict of interest in the way he addressed these matters in his later roles as, say, well, as Attorney General. So would you like to speak to that to, for, for a moment? Yes, and I'll be a bit more careful, perhaps, than I have been with some of the departed um, characters in the book. But look, I was as surprised as anybody to, to find among Kerr's papers a set of letters um, between Kerr and George Brandis. And of course, as you say, there's a wonderful circularity that Brandis then became uh, uh, the significant Liberal Party figure that, that he has been more recently and was in fact the Attorney General when I lodged the, the case in the federal court. So yes, there, there's um, some uh, obvious tensions there, I, I, I would have thought, <laughs> but, but there was not a great deal that involved the Attorney General at that point. This was a case against the National Archives, the Director General of the National Archives, and by the time the Attorney General's Department joined, it was under Christian Porter. But what's interesting about the Kerr Brandis letters is just what a close network of young Liberal identities, Liberal Party identities, Kerr gathered around him while he was in semi-exile in, in London during the 1980s. They come to the fore in about 1984, 1985, when Kerr is really fearful of the material that will be released in the 10th anniversary of the dismissal. Because you'll be familiar with, as I am um, from that period, that every anniversary leads to more, more revelations, more discussion, more argument. And Kerr knew that he was losing the public um, argument about, about his decision and the public view of it. The sense that he deceived the prime minister was a really profound one. And so he gathered Brandis and others uh, in what he called his gang, um, uh, 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 arguing with them that there ought to be particular placement of articles, placement of material in his favour over the coming weeks. So that's the area they worked on. And Brandis was very close to him. Brandis gave a very strong um, emotional uh, speech to Parliament about Kerr many years later, which was really how I knew I'd found that in the, uh, again through Hansard and realised that, that Brandis uh, felt very close to Kerr and then of course seeing these letters I knew they'd be significant. So it, things like that in the archival searches formed a wonderful way of breaking up what might otherwise have been a legal narrative and I called them little vignettes because they, they showed this sort of human element through the story that I really enjoyed. There were key characters, there were key moments. I almost felt as if you know, my journeys to the archive and sitting in the archives became a sort of a character in itself of, of that process of finding material. Um, and, and Brandis was one of them.
Well, and I think that's what you do so well, that it seems to me that for someone who's been trained as an academic, you deploy some of the techniques that I would associate as fiction, with fiction, where you, you, your timing in detonating certain pieces of information um, just kind of, you know, really uh, make the reader sit up and go, what? You know, my copy of your book is covered in exclamation <laughs> marks and I'm underlying bits where it says, he lied. <laughs> Well, look, I, I think that's that's a really good summation of the way I look at writing nonfiction, um, and and biography is a wonderful um, is a wonderful exemplar of that. You know, to me, I always thought, why do people say Australian history is boring? It's so fascinating. It's got some extraordinary characters. You just have to find it and bring it to life. And What's wonderful about a narrative nonfiction is that it does use the techniques of the novelist. I mean, you're quite right. I think it was, um, oh, I can't remember who it was who said that biography is a cousin of the novel. Oh, that's and, a good one. And, I like it, and, and it's exactly right. It, a good biography that is a narrative, well-paced biography, will draw on exactly those same techniques. You know, you have a narrative arc, you have characters, you have plot development. It's all there in the nonfiction realm if you look for it and find it and know how to use it. And so that's what I also drew on with this book. And it is different because it's the first book I've written in the first person. Yes. So, and it makes me realise how as an academic, even though my biographies are very, very readable and narrative and, you know, uh, have crossed over into that more popular realm, you're still hiding behind the subject you know there's a there's a certain barrier between well this is me but it's it's their story and this had to be my story and I found that a real challenge but I'm so glad I did it and I thank Henry Rosenblum the wonderful um, uh, 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 head of scribe books and also the wonderful editor of this book for really encouraging me to do that and to take that on and find that voice and I, I enjoyed relaxing into that and <laughs> making it a thriller Oh, you time. did. I'm finding did. sometimes I was myself quite excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good sign. Now, we've got three questions here from a very patient man called Russell Smith. So I'm going to start with the last one, actually. He asks, could history repeat itself with a prime minister's sacking? Look, Russell, it absolutely could, um, because the elements that, that Kerr used and in particular, of course, the use of the reserve powers, although he did several things on that day that were more than just using reserve powers, um, but in dismissing a government and replacing it with the head of the party that had lost the previous two elections, and that's what's so scandalous, of course, um, Malcolm Fraser, uh, could, could be done again. And in a way, that more contentious question of whether the reserve powers, certainly in terms of the dismissal of a prime minister that retained the confidence of the House of Representatives, as Whitlam did at all times, whether that power still existed was a live question in 1975. And this is something people often forget. This was not a reserve power that was, um, uh, that was unanimously accepted because to many theorists, but also to political scientists and politicians, the view was that the spirit of parliamentary democracy had taken over that aspect of a vice regal power and that it no longer existed. Now, what Kerr did by using it was to breathe life into it. And that means that if anything, that is a more powerful possibility than it was before the dismissal in 1975. Wow, so do you mean that in a way that sets a kind of precedent? Yes, yes, absolutely. Because Kerr used the reserve powers that many people argue did not exist. In fact, he had the formal advice of the Solicitor General and the Attorney General on the 6th of November, which was that if the reserve powers existed and the Attorney General argued they did not, but even if they did, there was no place to use them and activate them at that time when the Prime Minister retained the confidence of the House and he had advice, proper advice, constitutional advice, which was to call the House Senate election that he was presenting to the, to the Governor General. Now, Charters, of course, advised Kerr the very opposite and said to him that you have the reserve powers is known. And I ask, who was it known to? It was not known to the Australian Prime Minister. It was not known to the Australian Solicitor General. 
and Attorney General on whose advice Kerr had to act. It, that is a shocking uh, statement from Sir Martin Charters, and it's one of several letters in the immediate days before the dismissal that show most clearly their involvement in Kerr's final decision. And absolute mischief making, I think. Anyway, Russell also wants to know, does Australian history currently taught in schools properly teach younger people about the fragility of our democracy and sovereignty? Great question. Uh, in my view, I don't think it does, because one of the things that struck me as a, you know, when I was a relatively young uh, first year uh, a politics lecturer um, is that nobody taught the dismissal. And part of the reason for that was that everybody was scared. If you go into that, you're entering an area of political argument. And especially 20 years ago, it was still deep political argument about the rights and wrongs of it. And whatever you said, someone would disagree with you one way or the other. So people tended not to talk about, about it as an episode and instead to talk about institutional structures, constitutional issues and so on. In fact, it's a, it's a good question because only a few days ago, on Twitter on the same day, and this thrilled me with such delight, somebody replied, uh, you know, whatever it is you call, tweeted me, uh, <laughs> messaged me or whatever that's called, and said that they're a year 10 student and they just finished my book, The Palace Letters, and wanted to say how much they enjoyed it, but also said, it is shocking that we don't teach this in uh, uh, strongly enough in, in school. And the same day I was contacted by somebody else who said, I'm contacting you on behalf of my 92 year old mother to tell you how much I enjoyed the palace letters. So I thought, look, covering those two extremes of age, that's fantastic. I was really delighted. But it does reinforce, I think, that we've tended to stay away from this episode as a dangerous polarizing episode. And I think it, because it is such a case study in exactly that point about the fragility of democracy, the tensions that exist in our constitutional and political structures, it's really important that we look at it. You, there's no other episode in our history that enables you to look at that. No, now, interestingly, he's also got another question about this, uh, Jenny. He asks, Russell asks, have subsequent Labour governments generally lacked interest in the facts of the sacking? If so, or if not, which politicians were most outspoken? Yes, I, look, I think at the time, all of course were outspoken and all were horrified and people, and they still are, there's no doubt about that. I mean, the Labour Party holds this as it rightly should, as a dreadful blot on our history and one that removed a democratically elected government. In fact, Whitlam had only been re-elected 18 months earlier, you know, forced to go to the polls every 18 months. It was absurd um, and, and felt very, very strongly. The one thing that sticks in my mind, I mean, Paul Keating was excoriating <laughs> but, and continues to be and said that Kerr should have been arrested and locked up um, <laughs> uh, uh, and he doesn't resolve from that. But interestingly, and I think very poignantly for me, um, when the second volume of the Whitlam biography came out and Whitlam had been unwell in those last couple of years and so was... Uh, I told him of the Mason material and he was deeply, deeply distressed by that. He'd always believed that Mason as uh, a member of the High Court would never have done what Sir Garfield Barwick did. The other person who was tremendously distressed was Kep Enderby, who had been um, the Attorney General at the time of um, the dismissal. And I spoke to Kep Enderby in more depth about it. And the thing that really troubled him and the other Labor ministers um, who later were in the Hawke government, the later ministers in the Hawke government in particular, was that if they had known in any way about Mason's role in the demise of their predecessor Labor government, they would never have appointed Mason as Chief Justice. Um, which would have denied us a person who did, in fact, become a wonderful Chief Justice of the High Court. However, it does show that by failing to reveal his role, Mason allowed a particular view of his professional career to take hold in the Labor Party, but elsewhere, which was not entirely complete. And I think, and I'm pretty strong on this in the book, I say it's a display of great cowardice mm -hmm. to be so involved with a political matter as a public figure in secret 
and then refused to speak about it publicly. And had I not found that documentation about his role, we still wouldn't know about it today. Indeed, and there's that very harsh uh, comment that he makes when you, when you approach him, where he says, I owe history nothing. Absolutely. I was shocked. I was. It is shocking. It yeah. is shocking. I, um, had, I had interviewed him twice already and he knew what I knew. And it was the elephant in the room, I guess. And I asked him in the interest of history, would he speak publicly now about it? And he said, I owe history nothing. Someone who had been in a public position for much of his um, professional life, I, I was yeah, profoundly to say. There's a question here from Catherine Turner, which might be our last one. Would you liken the scandalous nature of the dismissal with the recent attempted coup of the US's Capitol building in DC last month? To the extent that it challenged our institutions, I think you can look on both as a real test of the strength of democratic feeling and democratic structures. I think what has protected us greatly from what could have been a much um, more damaging outcome was that Gough Whitlam himself um, made a decision that he would not either take legal action or do anything other than expect the institutions to act as they should. People often criticise Whitlam for failing to do certain things after he was dismissed. Whitlam was operating from a position of complete ignorance. He didn't know Malcolm Fraser was sitting there at Yarralumla down the other end of the corridor while he's being dismissed. He didn't know Fraser was already prime minister. He didn't know one of the conditions was that supply was passed. Whitlam looked at the institutions in the immediate aftermath of the dismissal and said, well, I will get supply through the Senate. I will get the motion of confidence of the House of Representatives and I'll be back in office this afternoon. And he rang his wife, Margaret, and Margaret told me this, that in our interview, that he rang her twice, the first time deeply distressed and unable to think straight. The second time he rang an hour later and said, it will be fine. I will be reappointed by the parliament this afternoon. And of course, Kerr ignored that critical motion. So, but Whitlam, I think by retaining his belief in the institutions, and we must remember that he said, maintain your rage and your enthusiasm. Yes. And I think that helped us deal with the aftermath of the dismissal. Jenny, it's been a riveting, riveting hour. It's flown by. Thank you so much for enhancing everything that makes this book so thrilling. Thank um, you, Carolyn. Thank you for the, a fascinating conversation. It has been fascinating and, and, and riveting and it has flown by and I thank everybody for their questions as well. Thank you. Um, the Palace Letters is published by Scribe as Jenny mentioned and is in all good bookshops. I believe that the Geelong Library has seven copies which are currently all spoken for but you can of course put in a, a, res a reservation for a copy um, and the good news is that Jenny told me earlier that there is a documentary based on the book in the pipeline as we speak. This webinar is being recorded so you can watch it again or you can share it with friends and it will be uploaded by Monday. On behalf of Geelong Regional Libraries, thank you for being part of the conversation and good night. Thank you everyone, good night.